God, hurry. No, I mean, it was like it hit the exact same spot that we Yeah, were. that guy's having a bad day. Yeah, he's not having a good day. Neither is he. He, I winged him. He's no. not maybe immediately dead. That no. guy's super He's dead. He's dead, too. No idea on the steel. It's too hard to tell. Okay. Um, Look. Yeah, that's your your no, that's your shoulders blown out. But hi guys, welcome back to Triple F Shooting. You can see I have my dork camera on my head. We're still out at the range. Can't really read my shirt. I'll get a picture later. It's a good one. But Father's Day and stuff. Most people when they think of Vietnam, as you can see, I'm in my nerd gear. I don't think it's totally correct, but it's pretty close. Most people think of this. This is the Brownells slash Colt parts kit, M16 looking thing. But, not too many people think of this. This was the most prolific shotgun of Vietnam, and we're gonna shoot it. All right, guys, we are back down in the dungeon with the 77E, and we're going to go over the features of this shotgun uh, related to just this piece, not necessarily the historically correct. This is a clone, and the easiest way to pick that up is because, A, it doesn't have U.S. markings, but even easier than that, it's blued steel and not a phosphate, parkerized-looking, grayed-out color. Uh, so without getting too much into the history of it, we're just going to go over this particular one's features. And we'll do the rest of the history on the tabletop. So starting off, we're going to go from the butt of the gun all the way to the muzzle. You can see that we have a T-shaped cutout recoil pad. That is pretty historically correct. It does not fit perfectly on this stock because it's just a little bit shy of it. The stock itself is regular old wood, but it has this dark kind of stain painted onto it. As we move into the receiver... The trigger guard is one of the points of contention where you can see that it is just a painted alloy. Looks a little bit different than the rest of the blued steel uh, on an original gun. That would have been even more obvious. But control-wise, I have a very kind of standard cross bolt safety here. I guess I should push it from the correct side. And we can use the slide release, and I can show you guys that the gun is very much empty. But controls are sort of similar to an 870 pump, not too much different. My ejection port cutout, uh, these guns are kind of easy to identify because the ejection port seems really high up. Uh, at least it looks like that to me. I'm used to Mossbergs and 870s where there's, you know, some obvious receiver on the top strap and then you have your ejection port, but that's where it is. Your lifter, if you get in here nice and tight is actually also your shell stop. So if I were to load the thing, the shell comes back against this lifter. And when I go to load the gun, I have to push it out of the way. And we can show that a little better in the drill that we have planned for later. You can tell I have no action bar on the right side of the gun. It is only a single bar on the left side, which was pretty common at the time. Most guns were single bar, or at least a lot of them anyway. Uh, up here on my forend, I have the standard, a lot of people call it like corncob style forend, also painted in that dark stain. This particular clone is working toward an earlier look, so I have a barrel band for my front sling swivel rather than, in later ones, it was actually attached to this magazine plug mount. And then I have a very short 20 inch barrel with your standard bead, and that pretty much covers it. With the tube on this one, it is only a four-shot tube, and so are the originals. Uh, just because this gun is a clone doesn't mean it's not as close as you can get. This is a Stevens 77E that started life as probably a hunting gun. Uh, they're fairly inexpensive. So somebody chopped this thing down to a 20-inch, put the right wood on it in a sling, and now I have something that closely approximates the real one, and I get to shoot it and not feel dirty about it. All right, guys, we're here at the tabletop to go through some of the history of this shotgun, which is actually quite a bit more interesting than I would have imagined when I first picked this up. Honestly, bought this shotgun because I was perusing through Gun Broker, as I am wont to do, and saw a Vietnam-era clone and thought, well, that's kind of cool, and started to dig into it. So, obviously, I liked it enough to buy it and have shot it a few times. It's nothing stellar as far as, like, the shooting experience, but it's definitely cool to have something 
you know, that historical connection and feel like, you know, I get to shoot something that people in the Vietnam War would have. To start off, this was actually the most prolific, or at least the most purchased shotgun of the Vietnam War for the U.S., we bought around, well, just over 60,000 of these shotguns, which would outpace any of the others by quite a few. We didn't actually use very many of them, though. So we bought over 60,000, and 60,000 and something actually went to the South Vietnamese forces. So when we see this kind of goofy, shorter stock with the big red recoil pad, that was for our smaller statured allies. These actually started off with somewhere around a 13 inch length of pull and added this recoil pad as part of the bid, or at least that's what the military was asking for at the time, just to fit those guys a little better. Uh, this would have been used for guard duty, uh, searching with, uh, especially if you're like a dog handler, something like that, checkpoints, uh, riding along in convoys, clearing out buildings, that kind of thing. Mostly probably used on guard duty. Now, one really fun function, or maybe it wasn't fun, but one really um, useful and practical function of a shotgun would be for someone that is a point man, especially in dense jungle environments. Uh, I believe one of the people that was awarded the Medal of Honor in the Vietnam War actually potentially was using one of these shotguns. The report doesn't really say. It's just probable considering the number of these were that, that were in country over all the other styles. Uh, with that point man thing being said, we've actually got kind of a point man drill set up that we're going to go check out. Now, before we get too deep into that, real quick, again, empty shotgun, yay, nobody's going to get shot in the basement. This gun does not slam fire, so there is no ability for me to hold down the trigger and just keep ramming away at the pump. Um, yikes. <laughs> anyway. Uh, immaturity level is high. So you cannot <laughs> hang on to the pump, hold the trigger, and just rack shots off without actually pressing the trigger each time. So there is a trigger disconnect here. I don't know how useful slam firing is unless you got really good at it because I, I think you can pull the trigger as the pump comes home just as easily and as quickly as you could just hold the trigger and go ramming your shots all over the place. Uh, that being said, one nice thing about a pump shotgun is you do tend to throw the pump at your target, um, which is something that a lot of hunters, clay shooters, not too many of them using a pump, but that's one advantage to a pump shotgun is you are throwing your hand right back at your next target or the, to follow up on it either way. So who am I to say slam firing is not important? Either way, in the point man drill that we got set up, you'll probably be able to see that it doesn't really affect your speed all that much. Um, I would even argue that it's difficult to shoot a semi-automatic shotgun as accurately any quicker than you can run a pump. So let's go check that out. All right, guys, we're going to do a little bit of an ambush drill to, I guess, get somewhere close to the whole Vietnam point man thing with the Stevens 77E and see how we do. Um, a couple quick things. I'm going to go ahead and load up on camera and you can see some of the oddities of the gun. The lifter is actually also your shell stop, so you kind of have to fight the thing every shell. Um, it hasn't caused me any issues yet. The spring in this one's pretty old, so hopefully it feeds correctly. And I'm going to be running buckshot. So the drill, I'm basically going to set my timer to a random start. We're a little closer than I'd like to be, but that's okay. We'll end up doing most of our shooting around 20 yards, I think. Um, I'm gonna start the timer and just start walking. As soon as that timer hits, I'm gonna go ahead and start shooting. So targets that we have up, I've got a steel on the your left, and then I'm gonna work to the two paper bad guys that they didn't have any Viet Cong targets at, at my local store. So we've got like dirty hoodie wearing guy with a pistol. So that's gonna do just fine to show the buckshot. And then I'm gonna finish up on the steel. After I do my four rounds, working from left to right. I'm gonna go ahead and do a breech load out of my wonderful Vietnam M16 pouch just to kind of see how horrible that is. So breech load and last round is gonna go into that center target up there. It's already got a few holes in its chest, but it'll work. So total of five rounds and 
I don't think I'm gonna do most of this on the move. I'm gonna be moving until it happens and then stop and shoot. So be focused more on the gun than my ability to move and shoot. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and load up. If you wanna come in nice and tight, you can see the alloy trigger guard, which is a point of some contention. I'm gonna do this left-handed and wrong. So see how the shell is actually holding against the lifter? I have to push that out the way. Again, left-handed, I'm not very good. I'm gonna feed this four rounds of buckshot because that's all it will fit. And I'm gonna go ahead and run it that way and just pump one in so that I can get to my breech load a little faster. And this is horrifically slow on my end. All right, last round. Oh, maybe I already got them. Okay. Was that four? Oh, all right. I can't count today. Can't count for my suppressor. Can't count for my shotgun. Whatever. All right. So here we go. Working from left to right. Uh, real quick, if you want to come back in tight, I just shoved you out. But you can see it's fairly 870-ish. I've got my mat, my uh, slide release up here in front of the trigger guard and my safety at the rear of the trigger guard, very much like an 870, or at least similar controls. Nothing on the back or top like a Mossberg would have or anything like that. So kind of an interesting shotgun and then I have a single bar on my slide so you can see there's nothing there on the other side of the gun so it hasn't seemed to affect reliability yet we're going to find out all right start my timer and we'll get moving oh god hurry Jeepers, mister, the shotgun gets hot. <laughs> okay, um, it's a real tighter pattern than I thought it would. Um, we're only at like 15 yards, but this is super cheap uh, buckshot. I figured it would spray out quite a bit more than that, but hmm, cool. So as you can see, a shotgun at short range would be absolutely devastating. Um, we'll get into the pros and cons on that in a little bit, but in that drill, uh, the speed is there basically as fast as I can run the pump. I'm putting rounds on target. One of them was a little bit offset. I'll put in basically a couple pictures of each target. So two of them were steel. We know we hit the steel. Not entirely sure exactly where, but I needed as much spread in that drill as I could get just to kind of work the shotgun back and forth. But we'll clip in the paper targets so you can see how those hit. And one of them's real nasty. I didn't expect this thing to pattern as well as it did. Of course, we're only at about 20 yards, but still using cheap, cheap buckshot. Speaking of buckshot, when this was issued, it would have been issued either with number four buck, which probably would have been a little bit better in that dense jungle. You have a lot more pellet count um, and still putting down a fairly sizable pellet with a decent amount of energy or double aught buck. There were some experimental shells during the Vietnam War with flechettes, things like that, but they don't really do all that well. The very cool idea and neat looking, but I've never seen any, you know, test videos where people actually shoot flechettes that are really all that devastating. Definitely not as effective as number four double up buck. Another little fun fact is that when the Vietnam War started, our military was still issuing brass shotgun shells so most people haven't even seen one of those because they are in no store that i've ever come across you can buy replicas and things like that they're very expensive but we're talking brass from the base of the shell all the way to the nose now that was a problem in the jungle because those things would corrode up fairly quickly so our government looked to what civilians use and plastic shells seem to be the answer because plastic does not corrode in the jungle very easily or at all with those shells being issued, they usually, well, I guess a rarity because they're very expensive to get a hold of now, but instead of using like M16 pouches like I did, which could have happened, they actually were issued 10 shot pouches that just looked like a little envelope and you'd have 10 shells riding around in there that you could attach to your belt or however you wanted to do it. But I would imagine if you were just a regular Joe and you picked one of these things up, an M16 pouch will hold, I think I can put almost a full box of shells. So that's quite a bit of firepower, especially for a shotgun. Now that gets kind of heavy and all that, but before we get too far out of whack, let's go into the pros and cons. Now, 
I am no operator. I was not in Vietnam. I know a few people that were and have talked to them as extensively as I can. I obviously want to maintain respect and everything else and only that, you know, have them share only what they want to. But as far as a shotgun goes, would it be better to have a shotgun or your M16 variant rifle, you know, or a um, M14 even for that matter in the jungle? Uh, I'm still leaning toward the rifle because it can do a lot more than a shotgun. You know, if you have someone pop out beyond 50 yards, this is going to start to become a problem um, where you may only get one or two pellets on target rather than be able to actually put direct fire. Uh, in the semi-automatic world, this is going to be more of a fight stopper up close for you. Um, but if you're allowed to run a machine gun like the military was, I would still imagine even a rifle up close with that full auto fire where you can keep you know a nice tight group with four or five rounds is still going to be pretty devastating especially with the velocity that that puts out but as we can see in the pictures of the targets uh the one especially where you know you got a couple in your teeth and all up high in the neck and chest there's no getting around that you're on the floor there's no getting through that round i don't think and surviving so up close this thing is awesome or any shotgun for that matter. Now, as far as the quality of this particular shotgun, government issued is well, rarely means top of the line. Um, you could probably argue different differently now where we're getting into very expensive new uh, firearm projects and things like that. But a lot of guns throughout history, you are giving uh, basically whatever meets spec for the cheapest that the government can possibly get it. So that is exactly why this shotgun was the most prolific. Again, we gave this almost entirely the entire order over to the South Vietnamese. Uh, they were about $32 a pop back then, which I can't even imagine, uh, which beat out Ithaca, uh, who were the other one? Winchester Model 12 beat out quite a few different shotgun brands at the time um, and the 870 actually came in much later in the war I believe the seals used it but so cheaper is not always better um, with that alloy trigger guard that you have you can see that nub kind of extends back into the stock apparently the most egregious issue with this shotgun was that since your wood is thinner here that soldiers especially in that nasty jungle would break these things off um, which actually helped me out a little bit because that's why this has real military wood on it. There are, and there is an abundance of this military wood for replacements. In fact, the military even started making replacements in the full length stock apparently because the GIs were basically upset with that super short length of pull, which I'd imagine was hard on the nose. Um, but without rambling around too much, if you were going to give me a choice of this shotgun or an M16 back then, given that the M6, you know, obviously the one that we have is a modern variant with little to no issues running um, cleaning kits and chrome line bore and chrome chamber, all that good stuff. If you gave me those options, I'd definitely take the M16. I have a lot more distance. I can still work up close. It's really not any longer than this thing. Um, but you would not be undergunned with something like this, especially for guard duty, convoy uh, protection, where you may have an ambush launch at close range, uh, clearing out buildings. I'd imagine in an urban environment, this thing would be wicked. Um, one last con that I can come up with, reloading is slow. Um, I am no Jerry Michalek. I cannot ram four shells into this thing in under a second. Um, on that drill, I'm using my left hand, so that doesn't really count. You can always breech load quickly, but that still takes a little bit of time to be packing shells in and out of your gun and going down. So another benefit to the M16 is you got 20, 20 tries at it, and then putting in a new MAGA-20 is just a, you know, a couple of seconds under stress rather than trying to get out of the way and manually slam four rounds back into this tube. So again, another point for the M16. We will definitely in the future be doing a video over that particular gun. It is also a clone with Colt's part kits, Colt's part kit, and that makes it really cool. But we'll maybe put these head to head in a couple of drills and run it that way just to see if my theory is all just 
theory and me just crapping out of my mouth or if it actually means something. But until next time, thank you for watching Triple F Shooting and you will definitely be seeing this guy again.